so more aesthetic uh, point of view. As you know, uh, <coughs> he uh, <coughs> developed a project called Soma Aesthetics, which is a kind of uh, pragmatist natural aesthetics. I mean, in some sense, it's the continuation of uh, uh, John Dewey's ethics, but uh, he uh, <coughs> wrote lots of books and, uh, and papers about uh, differences, not only between his uh, philosophy and Dewey's philosophy, but uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the differences about his other mentor, Richard Rorty's philosophy and, uh, and his philosophy. So, uh, please, Professor Schuster, I'll give you the lecture. Okay. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, there is a camera here. And um, it's true, John Dewey was um, an important influence on my thinking. Um, so was Richard Rorty. Uh, for those of you who um, are going to stay to see the films, so you'll see um, the three people who made my career possible, um, apart from my parents and all my teachers. Um, one of them is Richard Rorty, the other is Arthur Danto, and the third is Pierre Bourdieu. Um, but that's that's sort of like a double feature, um, because after this lecture, I think there's going to be a screening of um, a documentary film um, connected with my work. Uh, and I'm also being filmed here for educational purposes, but the idea is um, largely to try to take philosophy out of its um, narrow, self-absorbed, overly professionalized academic context and reach other people. And um, people these days um, watch more films and listen to more music than they read books. So um, working with cinema is one way of um, getting the message across. And giving lectures um, to a, a more general public is also a way of getting the message across and making philosophy um, more democratic in the sense that you don't have to have a PhD in order to think about ideas. And with that, I also want to apologize um, to um, people in the audience who are part of a conference on soma aesthetics that is happening now and for whom this lecture may s seem um, too elementary or basic. Um, try to understand it in um, a positive way of not um, oversimplifying but not trying to be incredibly um, scholastic. And I know there's a camera here, but there's also an audience there. And one of the things that I know um, from my work in Soma Aesthetics is how posture is important. Not a question of like standing straight, because nobody ever stands straight. But if I look at the camera, I'm ignoring this part of the audience. And that's a kind of insulting thing to do, but most of us don't realize um, how our posture affects our line of vision and how our line of vision and eye contact creates um, community with an audience. And I'm in no way an experienced actor, um, as you'll see if you stay later. But one thing I learned from my work um, in body awareness is how poor I am, like others, in actually managing um, to create good somesthetic communication with my public. And having said that, I'm going to violate um, immediately the principles of having contact with the public by reading a paper. Um, the director who um, did this documentary about me told me quite clearly that as soon as he sees someone reading, he just turns off the camera because it's just not very interesting. Um, but, but what can you do? This is um, 
a university, an old and distinguished university. We're in an old hall that has all the earmarks of um, ancient academic traditions and rituals. Um, reading a paper is one of them. Um, showing a film is not. So if I would just show a film, lots of people, maybe those over the age of 45, certainly, might feel that it's um, insulting to the public, that I don't take them seriously um, by not actually going through um, the blood, sweat, and tears of um, reading a paper in a room that um, is probably not air-conditioned. Um, in a country or a part of a country where it's um, paradigmatically hot. So, um, you know, with, with all those um, introductions and um, cautions and caveats, I'm going to read the paper um, Ethics and Some Aesthetics. Um, from Pragmatism to the Art of Living. Ethics and Aesthetics, from Pragmatism to Some Aesthetics and the Art of Living. So I'm going to start with a quote from Ludwig Wittgenstein. In his Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, uh, Wittgenstein boldly claims without further argument or even elucidation, and I quote, ethics and aesthetics are one, end of quote. The truth of this claim, of course, is far from obvious. Even its syntax expresses the clear duality of the terms. The assertion of oneness is thus meant not to report a fact, but to overcome the presumption of evident difference. Most intellectuals in Wittgenstein's time and in our own not only distinguish the ethical and the aesthetic, but often set them in oppositional contrast. Ethics and aesthetics are seen as designating two divergent domains of the general realm of value, governed by very different goals, methods, and criteria, and even embodied in rival conflicting stereotypes. The amoral aesthete, on the one hand, and the Philistine moralist, on the other, who has no aesthetic taste. While the ethical attitude is concerned with action and its real-world purposes and practical consequences, the aesthetic attitude is defined by our dominant post-Kantian tradition in stark opposition to the practical and is regarded as purposeless, disinterested contemplation. It was Kant, of course, who decisively defined the aesthetic in terms of disinterested purposelessness without purpose and thus in contrast to practical functionality and the ethical. As a proponent of pragmatist aesthetics, who celebrates the richly multiple and diversely important functionalities of art and aesthetic experience, I resist the standard opposition of the ethical and the aesthetic. Though Wittgenstein's blunt and cryptic assertion of their identity is inspiring and intriguing, it does not take us very far. My books have therefore tried to articulate more clearly their convergence, not only by elaborating how ethical and political factors are usefully integrated into our responses to artworks, but also by presenting an aesthetic justification of democracy and by elaborating the idea of philosophy as an ethical aesthetic art of living. So rather than trying to reformulate all these arguments here in summary form, I want to go in a different direction. I want to challenge the presumed opposition of ethics and aesthetics in another way by exploring in very brief and broad strokes some historical moments of the ethics-aesthetics relationship. Though pragmatism was famously defined by William James as a forward-looking philosophy, he and other pragmatists equally recognized that the problems and concepts of philosophy bear the imprint of human history, and thus can be rendered more clear, even if also more complex, by examining their tangled historical roots. By distinguishing the different historical meanings and relations of these terms, genealogical analysis will reveal 
that the opposition of the ethical to the aesthetic is not a conceptual necessity, but only a particular, albeit dominant, tendency in modern thought. So I will go back into history. Ethics is as old as philosophy, and in some sense, even older. For ethics encompasses more than the discursive philosophical inquiry about the nature of goodness, rightness, virtue, and the best rules for the conduct of life. Ethics also connotes a general pattern or way of life from the Greek notion of ethos, custom or habit, that may not even be discursively formulated in a specific code, and even if it is so formulated, may not be the subject of formal philosophical discussion. Although my previous sentence about ethics ran together and combined the notion of the good, the right, and the virtuous, these concepts, as John Dewey argued, are actually three independent variables of ethical judgment that derive from different sources and cannot be totally reduced to each other. As the notion of the good has principally to do with satisfaction of our desires and purposes, such as happiness, pleasure, and self-realization, the notion of right, instead, invokes ideas of law with their reciprocal rights and duties that are socially authorized and backed or maintained. The notion of the virtuous, for its part, rests on feelings of admiration or widespread approbation that go beyond the simple calculation of desired satisfactions of the good or socially enforced duties of the right. In expressing their virtue, saints and heroes do more than what is merely good or what we have a right to require from them as their duty. Dewey's point in distinguishing these three elements as independent variables was not to deny that they are intertwined in actual moral situations, but instead to insist that they are not reducible to one supreme ethical value or scale, and that they could often conflict in the ethical judgment they would suggest. Hence, their combined presence and conflict in moral situations make it impossible to reach a simple rational solution that could be mechanically derived from a single supreme ethical criterion or some supreme consistent set of such ethical criteria. In certain situations and in certain periods, some ethical factors seem to take precedence over others, but it is frequently controversial which factors should be preferred. This complexity is part of what makes moral deliberation often very difficult. The plurality of basic factors with their shifting emphasis in different contexts and problem situations is also, I believe, what makes ethical judgments and justifications very much like critical judgments and justificatory arguments in aesthetics and art criticism. In both cases, one cannot appeal to one simple criterion or set of fixed rules that mechanically determine a uniquely correct verdict. Instead, one has to use one's perceptive insight, imagination, and indeed taste of what would be appropriate. And the plurality of basic factors in ethics by making the concept of ethics more complex also makes the comparison of ethics and aesthetics more complicated. Aesthetics exhibit similar complexity. Aesthetic judgments are not governed by the single criterion of beauty. There are not only other aesthetic qualities such as sublimity or intensity or vividness that function in aesthetic judgment yet are not reducible to beauty, but there are also criteria used in judgments of art that are not based on perceptual properties at all, and thus, in that sense, are not purely aesthetic properties at all. Such important criteria, such as novelty and originality, clearly depend on historical rather than merely perceptual factors. The complexity of meanings and criteria of ethics and aesthetics is partly a function of the evaluative dimension of these fields, which encourages the proposal and contestation of rival definitions, uses, and standards. 
but it is also a result of the long history of these disciplines and the varied, varied roles they have played at different times in different cultures. So one way to dispel the post-Kantian presumption of the essential opposition of, the ethics, of ethics and aesthetics is to look back to ancient Greek culture, but also to classical Chinese culture. And so we'll start with the Greeks. Though aesthetics was officially established as a formal philosophical discipline only in the 1750s, most of its major topics and problems were already discussed in ancient times. This was partly because art, along with religion and rhetoric, was one of the rivals that philosophy had to displace to gain its cultural hegemony as the supreme source of wisdom, happiness, and the proper conduct of life. But another reason was because the Greeks recognized the very powerful formative influence that beauty and art could exercise on the human character and on ethical conduct. Because of Plato's often savage critique of art's deceptions and of the ignorance of artists, we sometimes forget just how important beauty and even art were to his ethical thought and to subsequent theories of ethics. Though Plato broadly condemned the mimetic arts of his time in Book 10 of the Republic, he did so precisely because he affirmed a very deep and powerful connection between ethics and aesthetics in the sense of beauty, harmony, proportion, and order. Plato argued that these mimetic arts corrupted character by deploying illusion and sensationalism to appeal to the lowest part of our minds and to stir up passions that were likely to corrupt character and provoke unethical behavior by disrupting the balanced order of the soul. But in earlier parts of the Republic, and later in his dialogue, The Laws, Plato insists on the crucial role of beauty and art in creating the ethical character necessary for justice. Arguing that justice is essentially a mental virtue constituted by the ruling of the proper order in the human soul, Plato then projects that view of the right ruling order onto the public order of the state. A state is just when it is ruled by the proper order of its different kinds of citizens, each group doing what it can do best for the better benefit of the whole community. The philosopher is being charged with the highest role of governing guidance, teaching the ruling group of guardians. But to secure the proper education of the guardians and to ensure more generally the proper order of mind that constitutes the virtue of justice in the individual, Plato insists that we must address aesthetic issues. Not only our intellects, but our feelings and desires must be educated to recognize and appreciate the right order so that we will desire and love it. The harmonies of beauty are therefore advocated as crucially instrumental in such education. That's in Republic 401 to 402. As paradigmatic of good order that is desirable and loved and that is not fixed by rigid mechanical rules, beauty provides not only an excellent tool for educating people to appreciate and recognize good order, but it also can serve as a model of good political order that cannot be reduced to unchanging laws or codes that rigidly prescribe all our conduct. It is therefore altogether fitting that Plato describes his ideal political state as Kalipolis, which means beautiful city, and that he describes Socrates in outlining the qualities and education of the city's guardians. He talks about Socrates and praises him as a sculptor who has made, I quote, statues of governors faultless in beauty, end of quote. That's Republic 521C and 540C. The crucial connection of aesthetics and ethics is also affirmed in Plato's account of the philosophical life as the pursuit of ethical aesthetic perfection whose inspiring model is beauty. In the symposium, his dialogue on Eros, Plato praises the desire for beauty as the source of philosophy, and he lovingly describes the philosophical life as a continuous quest for greater beauty that ennobles the philosopher ethically 
while gratifying him aesthetically. This quest is not simply to view or possess things of beauty, but to create or give birth to the beautiful. I quote, beautiful and magnificent speeches and thoughts and beautiful pursuits and practices that serve our basic drive for immortality, as does the begetting and rearing of good children, end of quote. These things remaining after our death as beautiful memorials of our life. Heroes, he continues, have readily sacrificed their lives to acquire that immortal memory of virtue. But the philosopher's ethical quest aims for still more, an abiding vision of the perfect form of beauty itself, which provides not only the greatest joy of beauty, but also the perfect knowledge to, I quote, continuously give birth to real virtue rather than simply beautiful images or occasional memories of it, end of quote. The aesthetic thus played a very central role in the ethical thought and lives of the beauty-loving Greeks. An exemplary life of virtue was seen as a beautiful life, and the beauty of virtue was seen as an important reason why such a life was desirable. Virtue commands our admiration and emulation by its attractiveness, rather than, be, rather than by relying on the imposition of moral rules through a fixed code that stipulates obligations and punishments for non-compliance. The Greeks thus did not sharply distinguish the beautiful from the ethically good, as we can see not only from their common use of the composite term kalon kai agaton, beautiful and good, but also from their frequent use of kalon, the specific term for beautiful, to designate also ethical goodness. I think that our ethical and aesthetic vocabulary still expresses to some extent their important convergence or overlap. We speak morally of things being fair, just, fine, or fitting, but all of these terms have clear aesthetic connotations and uses, as does the concept of balance, which we frequently use in judging what would be just, fair, fine, or fitting. The concept of order that Plato saw as the basis of justice is likewise a term with a clear aesthetic sense connected with the value of unity. Conversely, in our aesthetic discourse, we use the paradigmatically ethical predicate good, for example, in describing works of literature, drama, and painting, just as much, if not more, than we use the paradigmatically aesthetic predicate beautiful. If we turn from Plato and Europe to the Confucian tradition that defines so much of Asian ethical thought, we see a similar but even stronger emphasis on the connection of ethics and aesthetics. In the Analects, Confucius insists on the ethical importance of, I quote, achieving harmony, end of quote, rather than mere obedience to fixed moral codes or commandments. And he likewise stresses the important ways that aesthetic practices such as music and ritual help establish and preserve such harmony. An exemplary person who serves as a model for ethical conduct thus must be aesthetically shaped by attuning her character through the rhythms of ritual, propriety, and music. And I should add that dance was included as part of the art of music. Ritual and music are two pillars of, of Confucian ethical thought. But the Confucian linking of virtue with aesthetic appearance is further strengthened by its emphasizing the proper countenance, demeanor, and expression that virtue should display and that contributes to successful harmony. Entire passages of the Analects, particularly Book 10, are thus devoted to describing the kind of bodily bearing, facial expression, and clothing even that demonstrates such virtue. Confucius emphasizes that exemplary virtue wields its power not by moral commandments, threats, and punishments, but by inspiring emulation and love. I quote, the exemplary person attracts friends through refinement and thereby promotes authoritative virtuous conduct, Ren. Another quote, exemplary persons understand what is appropriate 
and because of their attractiveness, one strives to stand shoulder to shoulder with them by being likewise virtuous. In the same way, um, a follower of Confucius, Shunza, insists on the aesthetical, ethical power of music and ritual for shaping the person's character and behavior into a more successfully harmonious form that contributes to the harmony of the wider social group. Shunza clearly explains how ritual's aesthetic practice combines, I quote, the full realization of both emotion and form to achieve pleasure and beauty and instill the rationality of order and the knowledge of the right mean in conduct, end of quote. Ritual not only nurtures emotion and allows emotion its needed expression, but ritual also formally shapes emotion's expression to be more fitting, balanced, ethically and socially appropriate, and in short, beautiful. It thus improves the inner character while also influencing the conduct of others towards greater harmony. So Shunza can claim, and I quote, ritual is the root of strength in the state, end of quote. With music, he similarly argues that it is both necessary and pleasurable because music derives from man's inalienable emotional nature. I quote, music is joy. Being an essential part of man's emotional nature, the expression of joy is by necessity inescapable, end of quote. But music does not just express man's immediate natural emotion. Music refines such emotion and more generally man's character into a better, more attractive and balanced expression that serves unity, harmony, order and knowledge of the mean. Because music purifies the inner mind, Shunza claims, and I quote, music is the most perfect method of bringing order to man end of quote, and thus has crucial ethical, social, and political importance. I should add that for Shunza, music brings everyone together, and ritual helps keep that unity, but actually divide people into orderly groups, so it's not a kind of mob. The living sentient Soma lies at the center I believe, of our aesthetic feelings and pleasures. Though most Western philosophers, guided by our dominant idealist tradition, have ignored the body's role in aesthetic experience, I've tried to make it central by developing a discipline called somesthetics that also goes beyond concern with the body's external form. In this enterprise, the Chinese Confucian tradition, but also the Taoist tradition, has been an inspiration. As the Confucian tradition remains very important in Chinese thought, the very strong connection between ethics and aesthetics is axiomatic for contemporary Chinese philosophers. They would not dream of seeing these notions as inimical opposites because they realize that one cannot really understand Confucian ethics without understanding its aesthetic dimension. Aesthetics in contemporary China is thus a very central discipline of academic philosophy with significant import for ethical theory and practice. Unfortunately, in contemporary mainland China, this theoretical conviction is not adequately translated into everyday practice beyond the academy. China's environmental ravages of nature through rampant, ruthless industrialization is matched by a disturbing neglect of everyday aesthetics in its streets and public places including the fashion and somatic styles of even its sophisticated urbanites in modern cities like Beijing. Finally, as I learned from discussions with Chinese dancers, most notably at Beijing's Academy of Dance, there is not sufficient ethical consideration for treating the dancer's body in pursuing aesthetic demands of performance. I thus have no wish to glorify contemporary China as an exotic utopian other, nor do I wish to demonize it as so many Westerners now do. My aim instead is to highlight the value of classical Chinese thought to help us better reconnect aesthetics and ethics in our challenging present. 
So this connection between ethics and aesthetics has become problematic in contemporary Western culture because the aesthetic dimension of Greek virtue ethics has been largely replaced by the modern idea of morality as a comprehensive system of laws, rights, and obligations that should dictate our proper behavior. Though this system is now largely explained and justified in purely philosophical terms, it has been historically grounded in the idea of an absolute God, that of the Judeo-Christian tradition, who created the universe and its values and who still governs it in terms of absolute laws of both nature and morality. The terms ethics and morality are often used entirely synonymously and both derive from the same notion of habits or customs, ethos in Greek, mores in Latin. But contemporary philosophers often use these different terms to distinguish the idea of ethics as the general question of values and of how to live from the narrower idea of morality as a specific, coherent, and comprehensive system of obligations, imperative laws, and rights that should determine correct behavior. It is worth noting that Kant was not only the philosopher who gave this obligation-based notion of morality its most influential formulation, Kant was also the thinker who most decisively distinguished the realm of aesthetics from the ethical moral realm of practice by distinguishing the ethical moral notion of good from the aesthetic notion of the beautiful. Aesthetic judgments of the beautiful, he argued, are based on the subjective experience of pleasure, are free from practical interest or purpose, and do not depend on any concept yet they make the same kind of claim to universal assent as do judgments of the good, which instead are based on objective interests, on purposes, and on concepts. Kant, of course, realized that the ethical and the aesthetic have some connection. He famously noted that beauty serves as a symbol of morality and prepares us for morality by teaching us to appreciate things free from purely personal interest. But the influential thrust of his aesthetic theory was to make room for the autonomy of the aesthetic by distinguishing it very clearly from the ethical and the cognitive. Kant's meticulously um, differentiated separation of the aesthetic from the ethical or practical and from the purely cognitive or scientific, which is reflected in his three major works, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment is not the mere product of his own remarkably discriminating intelligence and his flair for drawing analytic distinctions. It is also the expression of the wider cultural forces of modernity and its logic of cultural specialization. Max Weber described this logic in terms of the rationalization, secularization, and differentiation of culture that disenchanted the traditional unified Christian Weltanschauung of the West and carved up its organic domain into three separate and autonomous spheres of secular culture, science, art, and morality, each governed by its own inner logic of theoretical, aesthetic, and moral practical judgment. The sharp distinction of aesthetics from ethics in modernity was extremely important in promoting the idea of art's autonomy and thus freeing art from its traditional role of serving the ideology of the church or of the aristocracy or of state authorities. This notion of pure aesthetic autonomy, which finds its strongest expression in the doctrine of art for art's sake, has been historically extremely valuable in the development of modern art. But the idea that art and aesthetic judgment should be seen as totally distinct from ethical considerations and socio-political factors is no longer either useful or credible. Much contemporary art quite explicitly makes ethical concerns and even political protest central to its displayed content. And the institutions that structure the production and reception of art museums, galleries, special exhibitions, 
art journalism, art schools, etc., are obviously implicated in a network of ethical and political commitments that are often reflected in their aesthetic activities. As even the high art modernist T.S. Eliot came to realize, I quote, a pure artistic appreciation free from the wider ethical and social concerns of both author and audience is an illusory abstraction or chimera, end of quote. I have been talking about aesthetics here in terms of art, and there is a strong tendency in modern times to equate aesthetics with the philosophy of art. But this is historically inaccurate and inadequate. The discipline of aesthetics was first established in modern times by Alexander Baumgarten in the mid-18th century as a general theory of sensory perception. Deriving its name from the Greek word aesthesis, Baumgarten defined aesthetics, as I quote, as the science of sensory cognition, and he defined its aim, as I quote again, the perfection of sensory cognition as such, end of quote. It was therefore not limited to art. Aesthetics was meant to complement logic, the two together designed to provide a comprehensive theory of knowledge Baumgarten termed gnosiology. Though he regarded sensory perception as a lower faculty than conceptual thought, Baumgarten's project of aesthetics was designed to show how sensory perception, especially through its systematic cultivation, could nonetheless richly contribute knowledge and improve not only our thinking, but also our lives more generally, including our practical lives. Baumgarten's original philosophical project of aesthetics was practical in at least two senses. First, the goal was not mere descriptive truth for truth's sake, but involved the melioristic aim of improving sensory perception, not only to provide better science, but also to make us better equipped to succeed in, I quote, what he calls the practical action of common life, end of quote. Better sensory perception can make us more sensitive to the needs and sufferings of others, as well as to the demands and direction of our own desires, and in this way also make us more effective ethical agents. In short, aesthetics was designed as a normative project meant to be applied beyond its own practice and even beyond the domain of fine art. Second, aesthetics did not merely consist of theorizing. It included from Baumgarten practical exercises to cultivate improved sensory perception. Rather than mere contemplation, aesthetics for Baumgarten meant action. Unfortunately, despite his affirmation that aesthetics concerns sensory perception and also practical matters, Baumgarten excluded the body from his aesthetic theory because following the rationalist tradition of Descartes, he identified all perception and action with the activity of mind and regarded the body as a mere machine or mechanism to affect that action but also as a dangerous source of moral weakness. The project of some aesthetics was therefore necessary not only to bring aesthetics back to its original broader and more practical orientation, but also to introduce the body into this pragmatic perceptual vision of aesthetics, an aesthetics for the ethical art of living and not just for fine art. The idea of aesthetics as a general theory of perception did not last long. Kant reconceived aesthetics as essentially a theory of taste, focused on judgment of the beautiful and the sublime. But the view of aesthetics as much wider than art did not disappear with Baumgarten, because Kant still endorsed it. Indeed, nature supplied Kant with the paradigms for pure aesthetic judgments, whether those judgments focused on the beautiful or on the sublime. With Hegel, however, aesthetics was even more dramatically reduced and disembodied. Hegel opens his influential introductory lectures on aesthetics by pointing out that the term aesthetics, and I quote, is so inappropriate and unsatisfactory for the field I think it should designate, end of quote, and he claims instead, I quote again, that the proper expression for this science is the philosophy of art, or more definitely and precisely, 
the philosophy of fine art, end of quote. Hegel then goes on to argue that what matters in fine art, and thus in aesthetics as the philosophy of fine art, is not the sensory perception of art's forms and the appreciation of pleasures that they afford, but rather the ideas that fine art expresses. These ideas and concepts are ones that bring to clear consciousness not our particular perceptions, but rather, I quote Hegel again, the most comprehensive truths of the mind, end of quote. With Hegel, aesthetics thus moves away from perception and toward conception, away from embodied practice and lived experience and toward conceptual truth. Aesthetics, he insists, and I quote again, aesthetics is a consideration of art by means of thought, not to the end of stimulating art production, but in order to ascertain scientifically what art is, end of quote. Hegel's towering 19th century figure casts its long influential shadow over 20th century aesthetics, and his identification of aesthetics with fine arts still dominates much of today's theorizing that is equally haunted by the long Platonic and Aristotelian tradition of separating art from life, separating poesis from praxis. As Plato condemned art as being too removed from reality, so Aristotle defined it as mere making, in Greek, poesis, in contrast to the ethical praxis of life. Besides rejecting art for its deceptive unreality, Plato feared art's power to penetrate and contaminate the human soul and thus corrupt proper action. He conceived both artistic creation and appreciation as forms of irrationality, artist and audience linked in a chain of divine possession whose source was the divine muse. Aristotle's reactive defense of art was to separate art from character and action not only by his doctrine of catharsis, but by conceiving art as a rational activity of external making or fabrication, in short, as poesis. Poetic activity as the making of a distinct object, a distinct external object, through some productive skill, was moreover sharply contrasted with the superior activity of ethical and practical action, or praxis. Action, or praxis, according to Aristotle, derives from the agent's inner character and reciprocally helps shape that character, while art's making has its end outside the character and outside itself and its maker, its end and value being in the object made. Action has its end both in itself and its agent, who is affected by how he acts, though allegedly not by what he makes. These deeply entrenched classical views that separate art from life were reinforced by modernism's assertion of art's autonomy and the Kantian opposition of the aesthetic and the practical. Again, I want to emphasize that these doctrines have had some undeniable benefits. Affirming art's aesthetic autonomy from conventional morality and practical concerns have given modern artists much greater freedom of expression. But our preoccupation with the art-life dichotomy and its vision of art as the making of artifacts rather than the refining of human subjectivities has resulted in the, fetish the fetishization of art's objects with little regard for their actual use in appreciative experience. It blinds us to the undeniable effects that art has on the lives and characters of its creators as well as its audiences. It leads to the abuse of artists' bodies and souls in the one-sided demand for impressive objects of performance without any concern for the pain, stress, and injury that such performance obsession incurs. Performing artists here become mere means for performances. But why not rather see them as ends whose cultivation as refined subjectivities art should instead serve to enrich? This idea of the arts as a form of praxis, a means to advance one's self-cultivation in the ethical art of living, 
is very basic to the traditional East Asian concept of art. What is important in the artistic process is not the objects or performances the artist produces, but the way the artistic process refines and transforms the artist and her self-understanding so that she can become a more complete and enlightened person. Consider the remarks of Japanese no theaters, preeminent author and theorist, the medieval master Zami Motokio, who insists, and I quote, the essentials of our art lie in the spirit. They represent a true enlightenment through art. Thus, if an actor really wants to become a master, he cannot simply depend on his skill in dance and gesture, which are mere external skills. Rather, mastery seems to depend on the actor's own state of self-understanding." End of quote. The same Za'ami explains that one aspect of self-understanding is recognition of the artist's dependence on wider environing natural forces. He does this by citing a haiku that makes this point also about nature's own beautiful cre creations. And here's the haiku. Break open the cherry tree and look at it. There are no flowers, for they themselves have blossomed in the spring sky. End of quote. Interpreting the poem, it's pretty obvious. The idea is that the blossoms do not emerge from the sole autonomous inner power of the tree. They emerge only through the tree's interaction with the encompassing natural energies and surrounding frame, such as the spring sky in which it can enfold its beauty. Since in Zaami's words, and I quote again, the world of nature is the vessel that gives birth to all things, including art. Zami thus insists that the masterful no performer must be sensitive to the environing atmosphere, the season, the setting, the time, etc., and the mood of the audience, so as to harmonize the performance with these environing factors. The aesthetics of performance thus involves an ethical, ecological sensitivity to the environment. In arguing for the deep connection between ethics and aesthetics, I am not claiming that there is no reason to distinguish between them and that there is never a point in contrasting an ethical to an aesthetic point of view. My point is simply that what in certain contexts can be a very useful distinction or contrast should not be turned into an essential dichotomy or opposition. In certain contexts, it makes good sense to distinguish the aesthetic technique of an artwork from its moral message, such as when we admire the former but deplore the latter, or vice versa. But from the validity of such specific contextual contrasts, it does not follow that there is a general contrast or fundamental opposition between ethical and aesthetic values, such that the terms ethics and aesthetics should be thought to denote two essentially different kinds of properties or values. Pragmatist philosophy warns against erecting useful contextual distinctions into absolute dichotomies, whose opposition is then unhelpfully read back into our experience itself. We typically experience the value of noble deeds and exemplary artworks first as a unified whole of value without distinguishing as separate or opposed the ethical and aesthetic dimensions of this nobility. In our appreciation of a Shakespearean tragedy or a Henry James novel, we do not first appreciate their artistic skill and moral intelligence as separate factors and then combine them. We instead experience an exquisitely unified synthesis where the ethical and the aesthetic vision are so interlaced that one can only subsequently distinguish them by refined analytic abstraction. We should not be so captivated by the distinctions we make through our analytic intelligence to explain our experience that we then take them to be inherent in the basic structure of that experience itself and of the experience world. The fallacy of such logic of reification of these distinctions might 
be made clearer by using other notions than ethics and aesthetics. So consider, for example, two concepts that are important for the project of some aesthetics. We can, in certain contexts and for certain purposes, usefully distinguish and even contrast health and fitness or happiness and pleasure. But this clearly does not entail that health and fitness or happiness and pleasure are essentially opposing and conflicting values and that, we encounter, and that when we encounter them, we should be experiencing them in some sort of distinction and intention. We could suggest a similar point about the philosophical distinction I previously cited between ethics and morality. One can appreciate the pragmatic point of that distinction without concluding that morality is essentially opposed to ethics, such that moral considerations could not figure significantly and usefully in an ethical life. Once we recognize that philosophy's sharp division between ethics and aesthetics is not an essential feature of human experience and the ontology of value, but mainly a brief historical chapter of Western modernity concerned with liberating art from the shackles of institutional moral censorship, it is, easy to, is it easier to understand the idea of an art of living, one that blends the ethical and the aesthetic? Though pragmatism was my first inspiration for challenging the divide between art and life that underlies the unhappy dis dis dichotomy between the aesthetic and the ethical, my efforts to remedy these divisions were equally inspired by East Asian thought, whose focus on philosophy as an embodied way of life and whose respect for the intellectual and spiritual dimensions of somatic training have shaped my project of some aesthetics and my notion of ethics as an art of living. In this ethics, one's behavior is not guided or judged simply in terms of established ethical rules or moral duties. Instead, one tries to give an attractive shape to one's behavior and character through ameliorative self-examination, self-criticism, self-cultivation, and self-stylization. This, of course, includes one's somatic dimension and the recognition that such self-improvement always involves a regard for other persons and things in our social and natural environment that reciprocally shape the self, affording the individual the opportunities of meaning, development, and joy. So I will stop here. I don't know what the rest of the program is like, but um, there are also... Um, images that I could show, but enough is enough, and I, I can stop here. Can I open the floor? Yeah, you can open the floor. Thank you very much for this inspiring lecture. We could see how to go to the live and this video is on to this And actually, I, I would like to know in how this thing is going to continue. So when will there be a film or won't there be a film? I just want to know how long I should speak in terms of the question period. Because, I, I, again, this is something um, very so aesthetic. I want to be sensitive to the audience and their needs of time, including the conference goers who've had a very long day. So I, I, um, I kind of like a framework. Okay. So 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your lecture, Professor. You said that at the beginning of your lecture that Richard Rorty was your mentor. Uh -huh. He had a huge impact on your philosophy. And uh, my question is that, what do you think? What is the most essential difference between your philosophy and Richard okay. Rorty's okay. philosophy? Maybe the thinking that philosophy is an embodied way of life? Yeah. Okay, that's... Um, 
So that's a, a very good question, and um, I could spend the whole 20 minutes um, talking about that. Um, I can, I think that in the Thinking Through the Body book, there's a chapter that actually differentiates um, all of the many differences that I have with Richard Rorty, but I can try to summarize um, the most essential ones. So um, maybe a basic one that kind of goes under, but the idea of embodiment, more basic, is that um, Rorty is a philosopher who rejects the classical pragmatist emphasis on experience. So um, for Rorty, philosophy is done only in terms of propositions, so only in terms of language. Anything that's beneath the level of language is simply irrelevant for um, philosophy. Um, this was not true for um, the founding fathers of pragmatism, um, Peirce, um, William James, um, John Dewey, and George Herbert Mead, but this was part of um, neo-pragmatism's analytic turn. So um, I'm a philosopher who um, took the analytic turn, actually, I didn't have to take it. I was educated as an analytic philosopher, which was why Rorty influenced me, because Rorty started out as an analytic philosopher. But what I realized um, through um, my work with um, dancers in particular, and some of that comes out in the documentary, is that there is a dimension of experience and understanding that is very powerful and very liberational and very um, pleasurable that can't be um, formulated in philosophical propositions or in language. Um, you can't um, describe feelings of movement adequately. You can't capture um, gestures and describe them adequately, and they're, they're things that you feel that are important, um, emotions, but not only emotions, that can't be turned into propositions, but are important for philosophical understanding. Um, when philosophical understanding is not reduced to epistemology or um, a certain kind of ethics. So, so the belief that experience is important and relevant for philosophy is a very basic difference because he thinks that experience is irrelevant to philosophy. So connected with that idea of experience is um, the importance of the body in philosophy. And again, if you understand philosophy as a, um, a discipline that's only about theorizing, um, producing texts, whether they're um, oral or written, then you um, have a good reason to exclude the body from them. Um, but if you see philosophy as an art of living that involved with how you live your life um, and not just um, talk the talk but walk the walk, then the body becomes very important. I would add that improving your um, somatic understanding and mastery can actually also include your cognitive abilities, your epistemological intake, because by having a better self-understanding of your embodied consciousness, you can make your consciousness sharper, you can control um, and notice when you're angry or disoriented, you can um, 
avoid pain um, so that you can think better, so that you can understand more things when you have better body awareness. So I would think also for the epistemological project, there are many advantages in developing somatic capacities. And this was something that was true for Socrates, for Diogenes, for the Stoics and the Epicureans. Um, so it's, it's an old idea. And when I introduced um, some aesthetics, I described it as a new name for old ways of thinking. Um, there's another difference that is worth mentioning, um, and that difference is, um, in terms of aesthetics, uh, Rorty has no interest or appreciation of popular art and of arts beyond the literary. And my interests include popular art and music and the visual. Um, there are, maybe I'll stop here. There, there, are, other, um, there are other differences in terms of um, how we understand practices of interpretation, um, but I, I think um, that would go into detail, into too much detail, and I don't want to like focus too much time on one question. So, I hope that's okay. If it's not enough, you have that chapter that has all of the um, differences. Yeah, you know, it's it's translated into Hungarian um, thanks to Professor Kramer and and his team. Um, so my question might be a bit longer, but um, okay. uh, so in the thinking mind uh, or the thinking body, uh, some aesthetics, you wrote about uh, sexual aesthetics in China, as uh -huh. you mentioned it uh, before. Uh -huh. And um, it is written that in China, um, uh, that culture uh, is aim through sexuality, sexuality and uh, sexual relations was uh, to produce a male uh, child. Uh, for instance, and um, that uh, men's uh, satisfaction and health was uh, way more important than women's mm -hmm. uh, in these cases. So let's say that um, uh, how uh, come uh, women's, uh, I don't know, uh, enslaved behavior mm -hmm. to these uh, sexual aesthetics mm -hmm. can be connected to ethics at all? Oh, no. I so understand. it's not really equality. No, no, I, I understand. So, so for this, we need some clarification. There, there's a very big difference between um, Confucian ethics and Taoist ethics. So the, the Confucians um, were very prudish. Actually, in Confucian ethical tradition, um, the husband and wife were only allowed to touch each other in the bedroom, and they weren't even supposed to touch each other's clothes um, outside the bedroom. Um, and of course, Confucian, uh, Chinese, ancient Chinese culture, um, like most cultures, is patriarchal. So um, there was um, respect for women, but that was a part of the order of the patriarchy and um, the older brother. So that's, that's part of the more um, hierarchical structure of um, Confucian thought. It was the Taoists who um, were interested in um, health and ultimately immortality. And they had um, yeah. they had an idea which, in some sense, is um, we can understand it from common sense that sex in the right way can be a healthy thing. And so the Taoist idea was that. Um, and again, this was a strain in Taoism that looked for um, longevity and immortality through sexual practices. 
And so the idea was that um, through sexual practices, you could absorb the energy of your partner. Now, this could go in both directions. Um, there are stories of um, women um, who could be, actually, who could take this role. I, let me just step back and say that this is a kind of um, vampirism. The idea is that people have energy in their body, and in sexuality, when you kind of mix your fluids and mix your energies, a person can draw out the energies from the sexual partner. And so the idea in this sexual alchemy for the Taoists was that a man, by having multiple sexual partners um, in a night, um, could increase his energy by absorbing the sexual energy of the partner. Why it wouldn't be with one partner all the time was because that would exhaust the energy of the other partner. So the idea was a kind of um, vampirism. Instead of like sucking the blood out of your um, victim or partner, you would suck out the sexual energy. Now, this was possible um, for both sexes. Um, so women could drain men just as men could profit from women. In fact, it was recognized, as it's been recognized in almost all cultures, that women are much more sexually potent than men. Um, they have more endurance and ability. So it was much easier for a woman to um, exhaust a man than for a man to um, take advantage of uh, multiple women. So the key for the man was to absorb all that yin energy from the women without ejaculating and therefore expending his yang energy. So women could do the same thing. They could absorb yang energy from the man, it's just so happened that these books were written primarily for men the way all books have been written primarily for men. And so um, there's no doubt that um, there's a sexist dimension to um, Chinese sexual practice just as there's a sexist dimension to Indian sexual practice, um, Japanese, um, I don't want to mention Islam, where you have, like, like in ancient China, multiple wives and concubines. Because that, that's the other thing. I mean, in the traditional Chinese system, um, polygamy was possible. Um, and it was just a matter of how much money you had to um, have many wives and concubines. And it was a symbol of power and status to have many of them. So. Um, how, how um, does this um, connect with ethics is that um, in dealing with a tradition, whether it's a religious tradition or a philosophical tradition or um, an artistic tradition, there are things that you take in and use to develop and there are things that you reject. So um, the fact that there are elements in, um, it wasn't even in, yeah, that there are elements in some parts of Chinese um, ethics that don't fit our ethical situation is no reason to just reject all of the Chinese um, background, just like, um, for religious people today in the Judeo-Christian um, culture that we live in, um, we don't reject the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just because Abraham and Jacob had more than one wife and had concubines and slaves. In fact, um, in the Jewish tradition, um, it wasn't until like the 10th century that um, uh, polygamy was, was outlawed. So 
times change and the idea of using history is um, not to try to recreate the past, but to take what's positive in the past and bring it to the present. So, yeah. Thank you.